righteous and true I am the grateful one Dumbfounded by you You are the mighty one Able to save I am the broken one In need of your grace Hey, do you know the difference between a Baptist and a terrorist? <laughs> What's the difference between a Baptist and a terrorist? You can negotiate with a terrorist. <laughs> Isn't that true? Oh, dear. Well, it's a delight. I mean, Arthur texted me and I left a message. But I thought it was at 6 o'clock and... Uh, so I just finished another meeting, and I said, i got to be at church at 6 o'clock. And uh, I came here, and then I thought, oh, my goodness, did I miss the rapture or something? You know, <laughs> just the cars are left, and, you know, usually people are around, and then they are all inside. That's wonderful. Hey, um, I am so thankful once again. Uh, Arthur is actually, I called him, he's on, hey, hi, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for keeping me company in this chair. <laughs> if, if, you, if I came and sat between you and your wife, or rather your wife sat between you and me, it looked like a reverse Oreo. <laughs> That's okay. God loves us, doesn't he? I don't know if this church does, but never mind, God loves us. I have more hair than you then. I, really? Yeah. Is that the... You know, just to make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. You know, uh, this church I'm at uh, doing their missions conference, I was, uh, they're a little bit more co complicated. Uh, it's the uh, faith, uh, what is it called? Faith, uh, faith Evangelical. And they have the students of Kobe College, and they have a, so they had this huge uh, after lunch meeting, and they called. Did you know there's 70 nationalities in, in, in Kobe College? 70 different nations there. So they had this huge uh, thing, and I had to speak on what they call the heterogeneity of missions, where they have an epic or an insider perspective. But the kingdom of God is sliced in so many ways, uh, differences to celebrate. And I know uh, Maine uh, is very unique in the sense it's largely um, you know, white Caucasian. But the cities, I, I live in D.C., by the way, and uh, I mean, uh, we've got almost every nation. So much so to do missions, global missions, you don't have to cross the seas. You've got to cross the street. And there's a tremendous uh, opportunity. I think increasingly, uh, you will find that a challenge in, in the growing cities uh, in, in America. Well, that's if the Spanish don't take over. Uh, uh, we, we'll be doing well. Um, two things very importantly to say before I bring us God's word and a, and a message on missions. Um, I was telling this church also that the most powerful way in which you can partner and engage in missions is through prayer. Uh, we looked at a simple passage where Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 said the harvest truly is what? Plenteous. The laborers are few. And what was Jesus' solution to the shortage of missions? What did he say was the answer? Did he say, go and learn computer science? He didn't say that. He didn't say, did you go, go to Bible college and study church planting strategy? He didn't say that. He said, pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers into his harvest. So that's the first thing I want to mention. If you could continue to pray for your missionaries, and I think Jesus knew that prayer is the strategy because those who pray don't stay. They go. They do something. And praying is a dangerous thing because you become the answer to your prayers. That's a scary thing. Uh, so I would encourage you to continue to pray. Pray for those without Jesus Christ in your families. Pray for those who have never heard the gospel, even the name Jesus once. That God will burden us to, to get the gospel to them. The second thing I, I was sharing there, and I want to say to you also, I'm deeply concerned about America. I don't live here. I'm not American. I have a green card, so I work out of D.C. I work in 10 restricted access countries, uh, countries where 
uh, Christians can't get into as missionaries. I'm coming back from North Korea and China, training the underground church in China to actually evangelize North Korea. They can do it better than us. Um, was in Cambodia and Laos. And I think Arthur may have, did he show you some pictures of Laos with that pipe and all that? I was with him, we set that whole thing up. Did he show you the pastors we trained in Laos? Some of them are still in prison. Uh, four of them, I think, are cuffed, uh, you know, ankle, their ankles in prison. What does it cost us to come to church on Sunday? You see what it costs those people to find Jesus and follow him. And when you partner in missions, I, my definition of a missionary is very simple. A missionary is an extension of the pastoral staff. Because we can't get there, we are sending. The word missio in Latin comes from, is where we get the word missions in English. It means to send. And the places that you and I cannot go, we are sending our missionaries. So they are doing what we should be doing. Does that make sense? Because the Great Commission belongs to each of us. And so I want you to continue to pray for your missionaries and, and, and keep sending. And let me say one more thing. I look around and I see several kids here, which is wonderful. Like I said, you know, as long as there's kids and they're making noise, there's a future for the church. You know? <laughs> uh, tell them stories. Tell your kids stories. We have lost a generation of Christians in this country because we haven't passed on the faith. They know all the names of the baseball players, but they don't know the books of the Bible. It's very sad. It's shocking for me. And, and I'm a Christian, humanly speaking, because Jack Wurtson, 30 years ago, brought me from India. He paid my way. Did you know that? With Wendell Calder. That's how I came to Maine, because Wendell has a camp here, somewhere in Danforth, in Living Waters. And I used to come as a counselor 30 years ago. And I come back and, and, I, and I see the issues here, you know, with all the stuff from Augusta and the situation in the country. It shocks me. It pains me. So pass on the faith to your kids and your grandkids. Many churches I go, their kids are not in church anymore. So this is a wonderful scene for me to see a church full of kids, Pastor Don. That's, that's a blessing from God. They, they are a stewardship for us <coughs> in missions. In many of our countries in Asia, we don't have prosperity. We have posterity. We are proud of our families and the faith that we can pass on. So would you do that? And, uh, you know, I think that's the best way uh, to engage in, in, in missions. Good. Now, if you would turn in your Bibles, I want to tell you the second step in which we could partner. Yesterday, I looked at Mark chapter 1. You remember that? How four men being one friend to Jesus. Now I want to talk about how do we partner together in going for Jesus. Bringing to Jesus is one thing. Going for Jesus is another thing. In Mark chapter 6, we find a definite way in which Jesus sends out his disciples to be witnesses. This is commonly known as the sending of the 12, or the 12 are sent to serve. You'll find it also in Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 9. So all the synoptics or all these three gospels that have a historical unfolding of Jesus' life take pains to record this very significant incident where Jesus, who called these 12 to himself, now sends them out as missionaries. You need both in effective ministry. You need a deep sense of being called. God has called you into his family. That's how you become members of the church. We are called in to experience God. We are called in to share in his life, called the church. We are called in to worship in spirit and truth. That's what we do. I, have you thought about this? Have you thought how precious this is? That on this day, as the earth rotates and revolves around the sun, around the world, 24 hours, from all around the world, praise is rising to the throne of grace. Isn't that wonderful? You and I are part of this chain of praise. You, you realize the biggest thing happening 
today in the world is the church. And I know the church in England is dead. In Europe, it's just frozen. America is dying. I'm sorry. Church is dying in America. Pastors are resigning. And people are giving up. It's become a secular humanistic nation. But you come to Africa. You come to Asia. You come to South America. You will experience revival like nothing. Unbelievable. The, 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 the group I trained before coming here in China, in the Hunan province in China, do you know how many members in that church? This is the Finyan network. The leader of the network is a pastor called uh, Jean Lesser. Jean Lesser. Do you know how many members in that church, Pastor Don? 1.2 million Christians. Christians in that one church network. Now that's mega church. I'm telling you, in China, the, China is no longer a mission field. It's a new mission force. The underground church is coming above the ground. And, and what used to be a communistic country is now the number one sending nation. And in two years, China will have more Christians than any other nation in the world, including America. So you can see it's a new day in missions. It's a new day in missions. Uh, some months ago, I was in Albania. And Ravi and I ministered together. So Ravi and I are sitting together in this air. Some of you may know Ravi Zacharias. He has a, he's another Indian. So, so Ravi and I travel once a year together. And so we were in this place. And we're sitting in this airport. And there's this bunch of Albanians. So we kind of, you know, who are these guys? What are they doing? We thought we'd talk to them. We found out they're missionaries from Albania. So we're like, whoa. So they're smiling at us and trying to, you know. So we're like, where are you guys going? He said, we are going to India to reach those Hindu pagans for Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, and like, Ravi and I are like, okay. It's a new day in missions. I mean, two Indians sitting in Albania and Albanians coming to the Ganges River to reach us Indians. You see, missions today is not from the West to the East anymore. Neither is it from the East to the West or the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere. Missions today, are you listening? Missions today is from everywhere, to everywhere, by everyone and all means. That's what mission, the, the, the globe is shrunk. We're all wired together. It's called globalization. Welcome. Anything that happens in one part of the world is instantly transmitted and experienced in all other parts. Wake up, smell the coffee. I know you're in, Bel what is this Belfast? What is this? Oakland, yeah. I mean, whatever place this is. I mean, I mean, missions is happening globally. I do not want your church to have this fringe mentality. Oh, we're only in Oakland, Maine. What do we have to do? Well, listen, get excited. Our God is at work globally, and he wants you to partner with him. And it's our privilege in outreach to Asian nationals, OTAN, to represent you. And I would really ask you to consider, get to know Arthur and Eloise more. Honestly, there's generation gaps, there's cultural gaps, there's all kinds of gaps between Arthur and myself. When I first came, I didn't know what he was talking. I mean, he, he's a Mainer with a strong accent. And I was like, what is he saying? I'm an Asian and I would say something he lacked intelligence. Then he'd say, what did you mean? And I'm like, oh, I told you all this, you know what I'm saying? It was such a cultural gap. But you know, Arthur and I have become best friends now. One of the reasons I'm here is purely because of Arthur. I'm very really honest with you. I don't need to be here. I've got other places. But I believe in what we're doing. I love this church because you love Arthur and Eloise. For years you've supported. I saw that picture in the lobby. Looks like his son and his new wife or something. I mean, I'm like, who is this Arthur? He said, that's me, you know. I said, who is that, Arthur? He said, I said, that's me. I said, oh my God, I'm just asking you, you know. He just raises his voice. He thinks if he shouts louder, it's clearer. You know? <laughs> and, you know, I'm a professor with three earned doctorates, a PhD, two PhDs and a DD. And, you know, I, I, and I'm sitting there and he, he shouts at me three or four times the same sentence. And, you know, in, in my kind of culture, if you tell somebody something three times, you're, in, you're insulting their intelligence like you didn't get it. But you know, we travel together and we spend time on our knees and did you sense his heart when he shared? I mean, look at his age and he is traveling from Maine 
to Laos. How many of you have been to Laos? Look around. I mean, here you have somebody from your group representing the gospel in a country that's so communistic and socialistic and people are persecuted for their faith. So it's a great day in Missions Church. One day in heaven we're going to celebrate all the things that Jesus Christ is doing because you prayed, because you gave, most of all, because you partnered. So here's what I want to leave with you today. What is the principles of partnership for us to work with? Mark chapter 6, let me read verse 7. And Jesus called the 12 to himself. Did you notice? Jesus always calls us to himself, into a personal relationship. He doesn't call us to church. He doesn't call us to join an organization. He doesn't call us to a particular program. Primarily, Jesus calls us to himself. Follow me. Did you notice that? Jesus always made himself the center of the issue. Who do you say that I am? This personal invitation is absolutely immense. Now, once he called him to himself, the end was not come and have a good time. He called them to himself so that he could send them out. If you read Mark chapter 3 and verse 11 to 13, you find this principle. He always calls people to follow him. That's discipleship. He sends them out. That's not a disciple. That's an apostle. So discipleship is the entry. Apostleship is the sense of being sent. Now, not the 12 apostles, but all of us are sent. We are sent in some way, measure or form to reach others with the gospel. So how do we go? Here's the answer. Look at verse 2. And when the, uh, sorry, verse uh, 8, he commanded them, this is very interesting, to take nothing for the journey except what? A staff. Reminds you of the rod and the staff. What's it supposed to do? They, they comfort me. So like, my goodness, take a staff with you? No bags, no bread, no money. This is copper stuff in their money belts. But wear sandals. We do that in Asia anyway. Do not put on two tunics, extra stuff. And that's, that's, that's the commandment. That's the instructions. Verse 10, he says, also he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there. Stay there till you depart from that place. Verse 11, and whoever will not receive you or hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Look what he says, as surely I say unto you, and this is a strong word in the Greek. Veritas means truly, truly, or of a, of, a, of a truth I say. It will be more tolerable in the, for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out, and what did they do? They preached to that, that those people should repent, and they cast out many demons. They anointed with oil many who were sick, and they healed them. Now, a few thoughts about partnership with regard to, to missions for you to think about for you to engage for you to seriously consider on three levels number one personally individually are you engaged in missions is missions a program in church or does it implicate you personally secondly in your family i think the family is very very important i'm coming back to america after 27 years and one of the biggest problems I see in our country, no, it's not the health problem. Yeah, we have all kinds of health care issues, but that is not the biggest problem in the U.S. Well, you say job creation. Well, we need jobs. That's not the biggest problem. Well, you say nuclear threat and internal security. Yeah, national security is a big issue. That is not the biggest problem in America. You know what I believe is the biggest problem in this country? the fragmentation of the family. That's where the problem is. The unit of society is crumbling in this nation. Who destroyed Rome? Pardon? How, who destroyed Rome? It self-destruct, it imploded from within. No other nation destroyed Rome. You know who's gonna destroy America? Yeah. You're gonna implode from within because there's no structure to hold you together from within. You have become just like Rome when it fell. It's an interesting study in, in, in parallel. And so I want to plead with you. 
take it seriously at the family level. And then thirdly, at the church level. What will you do for missions as a local church? At these three levels, let me show you how partnership works. Three principles for you to write down and take home today. Three principles. How do you partner? Well, if you look at the previous verses, Jesus has come and he's trying to share the gospel. And if you read the first six verses before we come to this section, his own family did not receive him. Did you know that? Jesus' own mother and brothers and sisters, Joseph must have died by this time, we don't know. But they themselves didn't receive and accept Christ. That must have been sad, isn't it? When your own family don't believe or trust in you. How do you think Jesus felt? He came unto his own, and his own doesn't receive him. How do you think he felt? He must have been totally broken. And don't be surprised. Many times this is true. <laughs> he likes to preach, does he? Uh, many times th this is absolutely true. Some of the, the most difficult challenges we have is within our own families. That is why we've lost credibility. Because people see us preaching and teaching, but we can't run our own families and households. We are having a credibility gap. Jesus in his own family was not accepted. So what did he do? Did he say, okay, forget it? No, he called 12 people. He said, I want to build a team. Pastor Donnie said something interesting yesterday that warmed my heart. He said, I'm going to put together a committee, a group of people who could think and do missions. I think this is very important. And I encourage you, advise you as a church, do that. Honestly, the pastor does not have time for everything. And this mentality, we'll pay the pastor and he has to do it, must change. That's never going to be biblical. If you find out why pastors were given to the church in Ephesians 4 verse 12, it is to equip the saints. And the saints are supposed to do the work of the ministry. Saints are not supposed to pay the shepherd to do the work. I think we've got it all wrong. What you do need to do is to step up. Maybe in this meeting, some of you who have a burden for missions, say, listen, I want to be part of a missions committee. I want to engage in missions. So th this is very important, church. Please listen to me. This is, this is critical. We've got to find key people to head up different tasks at the church. If not, you're going to wait till next October and have another missions conference and talk. You know what I mean? This is, this is going to be rigmarole. Every year, you're going to start something new and keep going back again and again and again. There must come a time where you say, listen, we are going to make this happen as a church. So what I want to do today is tell you how to make that happen. How to make missions a reality in your church. How do we partner? Jesus calls them to himself, even though he's been rejected, and he sends them out. Did you notice he sends them out two by two by two? Now, any, any ideas, any reasons, why do you think Jesus sends them out two by two? Why can't he say, well, there's so much of land here. Why don't you just go wherever you want? You run here, you run this. Do you? Why did he say, no, you two stick together? Well, you two stay, well, you two are, but why did he do that? What's the advantage of pairing them together? Accountability. Very good. Accountability in which area? Spiritual accountability. They aren't simply destroyed. Very, very good. Okay, they can be spiritually accountable to one another to stay close to the Lord and their commitment. Very good. What else? Yes? So, sure, sure. Matthew 26, the whole principle of prayer, where two or three are gathered in my name, there are my... So they could sense God's presence together. All right? Anyone else? Be more practical. Yes, brother? Support. Absolutely. What support? Moral. Moral support. I'm there. I'll be there for you kind of a philosophy. I'm there. I've got your back. Now, in what areas? Why two by two? What, what could happen to them as he sends them? And by the way, if you read Matthew chapter 10, he tells you, I'm sending you like sheep among Wolves, okay? So why would he send them two by two? Because they will help us help you do the 
good. So they won't be falsely accused of things. In other words, doctrinal integrity too. They won't preach whatever they like. There's an accountability. Are you preaching what Jesus told you? So there's a, there's a, there's a check and balance there. Okay, what else? They're stronger. Why? Because in missions, when you're alone, you feel what? Very lonely and discouraged. Do you get lonely and discouraged? Yeah, ministers get very lonely. It's very lonely at the top. And that's why pastors fall all the time morally and every other because they don't know who to share to. They've been caring for everybody else. Who cares for them? So in ministry, it's very lonely. And you need that mutual encouragement, that mutual strengthening, <laughs> that accountability. And this is so important, church, because if you're going to have a program for missions, is that okay if I move? <laughs> He's like, ooh. Okay. Anyway, it's so important that you have a definite program which you are accountable to one another. What was, what was Jesus trying to teach them? He was trying to teach them one lesson that I want to leave with you. He was trying to treat, teach them to trust. Trust. You know, the basic building block in any relationship is trust. If you don't trust someone, you're not going to have a good relationship with them, are you? I mean, it doesn't matter who it is. It could be your spouse. It could be your kids. It could be your brother. It could be your boss who you're working for. It could be your colleague or your neighbor. If you don't trust them, are you going to have a good relationship? Not really. But if you do trust someone, guess what? You're going to work together. You're going to build that relationship up. In order to build trust, it takes time. It takes energy. It takes efforts. You know, one of the things uh, I found when I came here to America 30 years ago, was uh, the whole principle of dating. And, and at the heart of it, you know, m many of our ladies think, can I trust this man? And of course the men also, can I trust this woman? I didn't have that problem because my father picked my wife for me. I mean, it was very easy. You know, in some of our countries, my dad picked my wife for me. He was in the, uh, you know, I was a teenager and there and my, my mom and dad were converts. They sat in the church. And uh, my dad nudged my mom and said, you know, who's that girl in this uh, choir? I said, what, which, well, the fourth from the, from the right, second row. Well, she said, this is Dorothy. He said, she'll, make, she'll make a good husband, a wife for Chris, wouldn't she? So I don't know. He said, well, why don't you go and ask her mom? And the rest is history. I got married to her, you know. So, <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, seriously. I mean, it's different. Here in America, you usually marry the one you love, right? Yeah, we love the one we marry. Which is more agape love? Think about that. Why do we love? Because we're committed to love each other. That's why we love each other. And you know, I've been married almost 30 years now. Never once have I thought of divorce. Now murder? Yes. Not di no. No, no this, this, whole, this whole aspect of love because I feel like it. What, you know, I, I counsel, I've stopped counseling people with marriage. I got fed, no, I'm serious. I got fed up. She doesn't love me anymore. Well, what do you mean she doesn't love you anymore? You know, he doesn't care for me. Well, is it all about me? Despicable me, part two. I mean, what, what is this? <laughs> love is a commitment. And I think Jesus is sending them in two ways. He said, listen, are you going to be committed to each other? Are you going to take care of each other's back? Are you going to morally support? Are you going to hold each other accountable? And church, we need that today at all levels. We particularly need that when you build partnership in missions. And I'd like you to think of that. As you commit yourself to a missions movement or committee, commit yourselves also to your missionaries at this level. The second thing I want to talk to you about is not only they had to learn to trust one another. Did you notice what Jesus said in terms of their travel kit? What did he say to travel with? Okay. I mean, this is very interesting. He says, don't take any extra money. Don't even take extra suits. Wear your sandals. Don't fill your money. with. Just go with the staff. Now, is that the dress code for missionaries? I mean, what, what's going on in this passage? Is he instruction like, okay, if you want to be in ministry, you've you got to wear this? Is that what he's saying? What's he saying? He's yeah? Encouraging communication. communication? Okay. Why this minimalistic approach to missions? I mean, why can't he say, you know, load up your caravan, you know, uh, put all the stuff for winter, you know, pack it up. What's the principle? Excellent, excellent. 
And this lady, she's got kidneys, very smart, you know? <laughs> that, 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 I believe, is the, is the root. If you study the Hebrew language or Jesus' culture, Jesus is saying, don't carry extra baggage. You are not going on a long trip to establish your own business. You're going on a short term to do my kingdom business. You see the difference? I remember when I was a youngster, I'm over 50 now, but when I was younger, I used to, uh, my, there's no electricity in my home, so we used to have paraffin wax, you know, the, the lanterns. And also, we didn't, we, we didn't have uh, uh, cooking heaters and gas, so we cooked with firewood. And mom used to send me to pick firewood, I mean, not, uh, to bring firewood to cooking. And I still remember, you know, you had to pass through all these lanes and bring it from that place where they chopped it. And I was a young man, you know, that's, that's before I got furniture disease, you know. Now I've got furniture disease. Now, you know what furniture disease is? Oh, you don't know? That's when your chest falls into your drawers. <laughs> I better go behind the pulpit. Anyway, so, uh, the, the, you know, I, <laughs> I used to have a V. Now it's turned the other way around, you know. But anyway, so I, I you know, used to carry this fire, firewood. And I would come in, you know, all those young girls would look at me, see, so kind of carry this wood and uh, act really tough. And my dad would sit and he'd just nod his head and snicker. Said, oh, dear, dear. I said, why, Dad? He said, son, load light and go often. Load light and go off. I don't know if that translates well in English, but in, you know, in our language means don't, don't load it heavy, load it light. And you can go more number of times. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what my dad advised me. You know, I have carried that advice, Pastor Donnie, for all these years. I have worked in 31 countries around the world, lived in four continents, and I've never forgotten what my dad said. Two days ago, I arrived at a red-eye flight from D.C. into Bangor, and I leave in a few hours from Bangor back to DC. I go back, last week I was in Atlanta, Georgia. Previous week I was in Dallas, Texas. And before that I was in Beijing. I mean, this is my life now as the executive director. But I always remember what I, my dad said. If you come and check the car, I don't have any check-in luggage. I just gotta carry on. Load light, go often. You say, Dr. Chris, what, what's the point? Listen, this world is not our home. We're passing through. Honestly, look at the stuff we accumulate in this life. My Korean friend did a research, and he defined an American. He said an American is someone who buys what he doesn't need with money that he doesn't have to impress people he doesn't like. You know, you laugh, but that's, that's, that, that's fairly true. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. We live on these plastic cards. It's funny, my friend was there. The other day we were, we were driving together in D.C. and, uh, you know, he's trying, I'm trying to get him involved in overseas mission. He said, Dr. Chris, he says, you know, I struggle. It seems like I'm just working to live in this house. I didn't understand what he said. What do you mean you're working to live in this house? He said, you know, my wife and I had dreams and we bought this big house. And after the big crash, he says, we have to pay up the mortgage. And he says, when I think of it, I work so hard simply to pay the mortgage. I said, stupid, downsize that house. Live more simply. You have to pay less. You'll have money to do everything else. I mean, how, how smart do you need to be to figure that out? But maybe you are like that. You're, you're just working to live in the house or working to drive the car you have. What, you know, what kind of a life is that? In our countries, we don't have credit cards. It's very easy to find out if it's God's will or not. No, I'm serious. If you have the money, it's God's. If you don't have it, it's not God. I mean, who we got to impress in missions? Honestly, you like my jacket? Yeah. yeah. This, these are a bunch of headhunters in Northeast India. The largest conversion of Baptist Christians in Northeast India were the Naga headhunters. 
And one of the ladies stitched this for me. It's hand woven with all kinds of texture. These are the headgears they weigh. These are the spears and the, and, and the shields that they had. And these were some of the machetes they used to kill each other. Today, they're the fastest growing church group in, in India. You know, and they live simply now, very simply. So the, the principle number two is, is what we said. Principle number one, Jesus was teaching them to trust who? Trust one another. Can you say that? Number one, learning to trust one another. Secondly, learning to trust in God and God alone. God and God alone. In missions and in partnership, people must see that our ultimate trust is in God and God alone. Do they see that in us? Honestly. I ask myself that. When people look at me as a professor from Liberty University, a CEO of OTAN, do they see the guy who's trusting in his competence, what I can do, in the academic degrees that I've piled up after my name, or in my ability to communicate in six languages? I mean, what, what's, what do they see in me? Or they see in me a street kid from South India whom God is using to change lives. You see what I'm saying? People need to look at you and say, you know, I don't know how this guy from South India could do all this. Did Jack Wurtson realize when he brought this young fellow from India that he would be the professor of theology and global studies of the world's largest Christian university? Did he know that? That's what I am today at Liberty University. I'm the professor for theology and global studies in the largest Christian university in the world. Every week, I have 1,200 students in my class, one class. And I was a street kid who studied under a lamppost. And my mother borrowed money to put me in a school so I can learn English. People need to see God is the one who's at work. And, and look at us. Look how we do church. Who are we impressing, really, at the end of the day? I have nobody to impress, only one person to please. That's a good way to live for an audience of one. Try that. It's so liberating. And the more we simplify, the more we exemplify Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought of this? We follow a Lord who literally came into this world the way he left it, naked. He never owned a piece of property. Never wrote a book. <laughs> he never traveled more than, you know, the state of uh, Waterville or whatever this is. I mean, he didn't travel much at all. And yet today, the largest following in the world are Christians. Did you know that? What kind of a follower of Jesus are we? Missions needs to simplify in order to get the gospel out. And I want to encourage you to do that. So number one, they must learn to trust in one another. Secondly, they must learn to trust in God and God alone. Now, there's a third thing he asked them to trust, and this is very interesting. He said, when you go into a place and you're going to share the gospel, find a house, and whichever house invites you, what do you got to do? Stay there and look at the menu and order lobster off of the menu. Is that what he said? <laughs> and then ask for blueberry dessert. Is that what we're having tonight, Pastor? Lobster and blueberry? Yeah. Yeah, he smiles. <laughs> you see, this, this is very important, church. He said, whatever they give you, what? Eat it. My concern about the church in America and the reason why we are lagging in missions is we have so much to live with and so little to live for. We get what we want, then we don't want what we got. The very things we are creating are destroying us today. It's the paradox of our time. We have so many time-saving devices and no time to do anything for God. Isn't that ironical? And Jesus says to his disciples, listen, when you go there, not only simplify, he said, learn contentment. Be content. We are so average. We are keeping up with the Jones. We've got to have something more. Like Rockefeller when he died. I mean, the richest man in America is dying, J.D. Rockefeller. 
Someone went and asked him, Rockefeller, you're miserable. What will make you happy? The richest man in the world. He said, one more dollar. Because money never satisfies. Have you seen any pockets on shrouds? Have you ever seen a, a U-Haul follow a hearse? You can't take it with you. This is why you need to invest it in missions here and now. You say, but we're a small church, and you know, we don't have much, we have employment. Well, you always give proportionally. God blesses us when we, it is more blessed to what? Give than to receive. receive. Try it, I challenge you. Try to outgive God. I tried it, I couldn't. It's wonderful when you learn to be a generous Christian. Keep giving, it's going to come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, overflowing. The joy of giving. I am convinced you're never more like God than when you're giving. God so loved the world that he what? And what a way to invest a mission. God doesn't see how much you give as much as how much you've got left. That's the principle of the widow's two might. I remember Billy Graham's brother-in-law, Leighton Ford, is one of my mentors. And once a year I spend some time with Leighton. And uh, they were telling me of the time when Billy and Ruth were in this meeting and the offering bag suddenly came. And so Billy quickly pulled out you know, a note and he was putting, as he dropped the note, he suddenly realized there were two zeros after the one. And he went, Oops. he looked at Ruth and he said, sweetheart, I accidentally put in a hundred dollars. You know, in America, all the notes, the same color and size. And his godly wife, Ruth, looked at him and said, Honey, don't be worried. God only accounted you for $10. <laughs> because God looks at the what? Heart. He knows what we give. He knows what we give. The importance of learning to trust. And this is the third point. To trust the goodwill of others. The goodwill of others. Let me ask you, were these people saved? These houses they went to? Were they saved? The answer is no, because they're going to preach the what? Gospel. So obviously they, they haven't yet responded to the gospel, right? So they go and they give them something to eat. It is the idea of contentment. It is the sense of satisfaction with God that makes them winsome. That they say, wow, these people are not complaining. Have you been with people? They keep complaining and murmuring. Have you been with them? No, don't look at your wife. I mean, have you been, have you been with people who, who always complain? No matter what, they're like, I don't know, you know. They keep complaining. Well, they, if there's nothing to complain, they complain that there's nothing to complain. You know? It's like the China guy who came to America. And the border fellow stopped me. He said, where are you coming to America from China? He said, hmm. He said, no, tell me, why, what do you lack in China that you want to come to America? Do you have job problems in China? He said, no, can't complain. He said, do you have uh, unemployment problems? Do you have problems with social security in China? He said, no, can't complain. He said, do you have hunger and, and lack of food in China? He said, no, can't complain. He said, do you, do you lack freedom and ability in China? He said, no, can't complain. He said, why do you want to come to America? He said, I can complain. <laughs> You know, we live in, we complain about everything. We're upset about it. And let me tell you as a church, one of the principles of a missionary spirit is a sense of satisfaction with our Savior. Is Jesus all that you need, really? Let me tell you a story about this third point. I remember when I was church planting in South India, we're married, we, ha we, we, we had our first daughter, and uh, now she's finishing her fourth year medicine, she's all grown up now. But I remember when she was very, very young, we decided to go and plant a church in an area where there were decoits and naxalites, they come and plunder houses. And my father and mother were very upset with me. Well. They basically like the granddaughters better, you know. I mean, they're like, why would you take these kids? You guys go, do what you want. My father-in-law always asked me a very deep theological question. 
why didn't God give us grandkids before he gave us kids? You know, li life would have been so much more better, he thought. Anyway, so we, we go to this area, and, and I go to do these church planting conferences and training, and during that week, you won't believe this, the decoits came and took everything we had. I had taken Dorothy, my wife, and the little kid to leave her at the mom. She usually doesn't go. She's very independent. You know how women can be, you know. But anyway, I, I, I took her to stay in mom's place, and their lives were saved. But everything we had in our home was taken, robbed. Because in our countries, there's no justice. You have to bribe the police. By the time you go through that, you know. Someone told me, you know why it takes the police so long to come when you call them when the house is robbed? because they have to change their clothes from robbers to police, you see. So, you know, it's, it's so corrupt in this, in, in our countries. And I still remember I was so discouraged. I sat there, I called my assistant pastor in this church we were planting. I said, Satidas, really, I, 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 I'm not well, I can't come. Just share something, sing some songs, pray, take me. And I was, I was surprised that evening. I hardly, we didn't even have furniture to sit there. I sat in that house. So down and discouraged, I heard a knock on the door. I went to the door, and as I opened it, there was this lady, and she had this little casserole kind of a thing, and, and she brought something to eat and some rice to cook. I was so thankful. Pastor, can I come in? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can come in. You know, you put this artificial plastic smile, like everything's fine. She came. Next, again the door. Knock. You know, 28 families came to see me that evening in Dorothy. They brought food, they brought clothes for us. And I had worked in that area for about six years. And I felt nobody cared for me as the pastor. I planted this church. I'd been beaten by Hindus and thrown on a field bleeding. And that day I was surprised, 28 families. And then they popped up and shared tests. Pastor, thank you for leading me for Jesus Christ. Thank you for uh, baptizing my kid after he was saved. Thank you for getting my daughter married. You know, we make good matchmakers in India. So like, oh, we really have. And one by one, everybody shared their testimonies. I couldn't believe how much they loved me. And then they stood, and all the neighbors were like, what's going on in that house? Is that a party? You know, they said, that guy's house got robbed. And so... What happened now? Well, all those people that belong to him are come to see him. And I, it, we went late into the night. We celebrated. They were going back. I thought to myself, you know, this is interesting. And Dorothy was there. I said, well, let me do the dishes, you know. So I'm doing the dishes. And, you know, in our, our place is hardly any water. just trickles. Hard. You know, I don't know if it was my tears flowing or the water. I was slowly washing the dishes. And Dorothy came, she put her hand around me. She said, Chris, are you all right? I said, I guess I am. And I said to her, I said, you know, if this is what, this is what it takes to know that I'm loved by my members, I don't mind my house being robbed every year. Just to know people love me for who I am, not just what I do. And that is so important in ministry. And the next Sunday, I preached a message. And I really believe this church. I am convinced that we only believe that God is all we need until God is all we have. Amen. Let me say that again. You really don't believe that God is all you need until God is all you? That was the day I realized he's all I need. I have nothing else. Now we have a nice home, we drive two cars, we earn a few degrees, and we travel around the world. But I'll never exchange that experience of being robbed. My entire house, shredded, sitting on the floor, not even furniture, and recognizing God is all I need because God is all I had. You know, we have to come to that point of total dependence on God and God alone, and the goodwill of people. I mean, I'm supposed to help them, but you become a vulnerable leader. They are helping you. Some of us leaders, Christian leaders, pastor leaders, missionary leaders, we are arrogant. 
We think we went to Bible college, we got some knowledge, we got some experience, we got everybody taken care of. We're going to help everybody. That's why we have what they call mental breakdowns in ministry. All kinds of burnouts. Because we don't become vulnerable. And mission leaders need to be vulnerable. I got a board uh, whom I report to. And regularly I meet with my board members and I say, man, please help me. I'm confused. Or, man, please help. I don't know what to do. Or I'm very discouraged in this area. Could you, could you, could you guide me? And they're like, oh, Dr. Nyanakin, you've earned three doctorates. You should know. I said, I don't know. Would you help me? Nothing wrong with that. Some of us have what I call evangelical pride. We're arrogant. And Jesus says, listen, if you want to be my servant, sometimes you must learn to trust the goodwill of others. Go, stay in their house, eat what they give you. That's a form of trust, isn't it? It is. And folks, I want to encourage you with these three points from this passage. Would you start very simply? Number one, learn to trust one another. We need each other. None of us are as good as all of us put together. If you're married, tell your spouse how much you love her or her. Commit yourself to your family. We need each other. I was in Hawaii and uh, leading some seminars in the island of Maui. Where do you think I got my tan? Now, anyway, so I, I, you know, I, I go regularly to Maui and we have the Hagia Institute where I train these leaders in Hagia Institute. And my colleague is a Polynesian Hawaiian. So I was doing a seminar on the family and I said to him, Rachi, what's the word for, for family? He said, there's no word for family. I said, what do you mean? What, what do you say? Well, he says, there's a word, but it, it doesn't mean family. So I said, well, what does family mean? Well, he said, it's the word ohana. Ohana. No, I know aloha. I don't know what, what is ohana? Well, he said, it's complicated. I said, come on, don't insult my intelligence. What is it? I mean, try me. Tell me, what does ohana mean? Well, he says, it's not a word, it's like a phrase. I said, well, what is the like a phrase? Well, he says, ohana means we belong together and no one gets left behind. I thought that was a precious definition for family. We belong together and nobody gets left behind. Are you a church family? That means you belong and no one gets What a wonderful way to grow, Ohana. That's what family means. And I pray that you will become a missional family, that Arthur and Eloise, whom you support and send to Laos to those people, you and I can't get there, but they are part of our mission family. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not people you write out, two old ladies writing a checkout every month. That's not missions. Missions is implicating your life. Because they belong to us. They're an extension of our church and ministry. Does this make sense? That is how I would like you to form a missions committee. Go to Pastor Donnie and say, Pastor, can we be part of that committee? I want to be a missional catalyst in this church. Whoever you are, whether you're young or old or men or women, doesn't matter about age. Come together and do this. So three principles for partnership. The basic building block for any relationship is what class? Trust. And Jesus is teaching his disciples to trust in at least three levels. Level number one, learn to trust one another. Go two by two. Lesson number two, learn to trust God and God alone. Jehovah Jireh. God will take care of your needs. Let people see that. Third, learn to trust the goodwill of others. Don't be so arrogant. Oh, they're not Christians. I don't need anything. I, want to, I don't want to learn anything from them. No, humble yourself. Be a vulnerable leader and see how God works through them. You say, Dr. Chris, why do I have to do all that? Well, one last point. Did you realize in this whole scenario of the sending, which is missions, there's another level of trust we often forget. Who was speaking to who in this section? Who's speaking? To whom? To his dis- who, who are these disciples? This is a motley crew. You know, 
this bunch of fishermen, illiterate, unlearned, always fighting among each other. You remember them? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? One of them goes to their mama and says, Mama, I want to sit one on the left hand and one on the right hand of Jesus. You know, always fighting. Who's the greatest? Jesus is going to die and they all deny him. Here's my point. Did you realize in this passage, by sending these 12, Jesus himself is learning to trust these men. All of them will forsake him at the cross. One of them, the leader, will deny him three times to a little girl. And one of them will sell him for the price of a slave and betray him with a kiss. And yet Jesus trusted them. To the very end, he loved them. He washed his feet, their feet. Let me ask you, if you had somebody like Judas in your church, would you make him the treasurer? Jesus made Judas what? So what did he do? He trusted him to the very end. And you know why? I, what I found out, church? Many times relationships are broken because they've let us down. You know, I counsel people and I tell to this girl, why, ask this girl, why aren't you married? So I don't trust men any, anymore. Because the you know, last two guys I know, they abuse me. They use me. I, know, I, I, I think I'm single. I ask guys, why don't you work with this mission organization? Oh, the last mission organization, they were a bunch of hypocrites. I don't, you know what I mean? They let him down. And maybe you're in church this evening and you've had some bad experiences because people let us down. Wake up, smell the coffee. We're all human. But there's someone who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let me use more young people's language. Jesus said, I will never let you down, and I'll never let you go. Isn't that nice? I'll never let you down, and I'll never let you. You can trust him. He is the same yesterday, today, and for. If Jesus himself had to learn to trust this motley crew of fickle-minded disciples who failed him all the time, can't we trust one another in mission? Shouldn't we? Shouldn't we partner in order to see the world saved, church? That, for me, is the key for missions. Trust. Trust, number one, one another. Trust, number two, and God alone. Trust, number three, the goodwill of others. Remember why? Because Jesus is trusting you. He trusts you. John 20 and verse 21. As the Father sent me, so sent. Imagine this. The commission that God Almighty gave to Jesus, Jesus now transfers to us. That's a great privilege, church. Would you trust him? And if you trust him, will you obey him? The story is told of Jesus. This is just a parable. After the resurrection, he ascended into heaven. And all the angels were very happy. Yes, mission accomplished. You went there, you, the cross, the resurrection, salvation, the message of redemption is procured. They were celebrating in heaven. And then all the angels gathered around Jesus and they were so encouraged and they came to Jesus. He said, Jesus, this is amazing. Victory is ours because of the cross and the resurrection. Now the gospel will change the whole world. And then they looked at Jesus and said, this, this message of the gospel, who have you entrusted it to? <laughs> and Jesus looked down from the clouds. He called the angelic host. He says, you see those 11 men around that Mount Olives place? Yeah. I have given that to them. And they were like, you've given the plan of redemption to those 11 men? We watched those guys. There was a silence in heaven. 
And then one angel kind of mustered a little bit of courage and said, Jesus, can I ask you a question? Yeah, what is it? He said, we've seen these men. This must be some business angel, I'm sure. He said, you know how they failed? Could I ask you a question, Jesus? In case these guys fail, do you have a plan B? <laughs> and Jesus turned to the hosts of heaven and he said, there is no plan B. They are the plan. Church, do you understand this? Acts chapter 4 verse 12. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. But which name? Name of? Jesus. And Jesus says, there is no other plan but missions. God sends you to win the lost at any cost while you can. Will you partner? Learn to trust. Trust number one. One another. Number two. And God alone. Number three, the goodwill of others because Jesus is trusting you. <coughs> Shall we pray? Take a minute as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We do a lot of business in this world. Would you pause for a moment? Would you, would you do business with God tonight? Really? Don't worry about the person next to you. Would you examine your own heart? We've read an incident in the Bible on the sending of the twelve. We've heard Jesus say, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Church, no matter who you are, young and old, boy or girl, would you say, Lord, I'm willing to go? It may be across the street. It doesn't have to be overseas. Are you willing to be sent? Would you develop trust in God and God alone? Where is our faith? If your faith is in God, then would you obey him? Would you step out to the person you're working with, to your neighbors, to your own family, and share with them the love of Jesus? I want to pray for you as we close and as I head back home. But if you say, Chris, just pray for me. I, I don't know where, I don't know when, I don't even know how, but I do know that I need to be missional. I need to share my faith. I need to grow in this trust stuff you're talking about. I want to trust and obey because there's no other way. Please pray for me. As I heads are bowed and you say, Chris, pray for me tonight. Would you lift your hand up wherever you are? I just want to pray for you. If you don't mean it, don't raise your hand up. But if you mean it and raise your hand, you know, God will make a way for you. He will use you for his glory. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those of us raising our hands. Holy Spirit, would you put your hand in our hand? We are so weak. We let you go. But thank you for the promise, Jesus, that you will never let us go. Would you hold on? Even when we can't hold on to our promises, would you hold us? And lead us in paths of righteousness to share your love with others. We thank you for the opportunity to belong to a church that love the word of God, that love the souls of people, and want to send people out to see them saved. Lord, I thank you for Grace Bible Church. Thank you so much for Pastor and Mrs. Niles and their ministry here. Thank you for the members of this church. And Lord, I don't know what they've gone through as a church in journeying towards you, but would you continue to lead them even as they simplify their work, even as they sacrificially give, would you lead them from strength to strength even as you change each one of us from glory to glory until we see Jesus. And all God's people said, God bless you and thank you very much. You are the faithful one, righteous and true. I am the grateful one, dumbfounded by you. You are the
the mighty one able to save I am the broken one in need of your grace You are my savior my shelter my way you're my sword my defender my king You are my portion my rock and my fortress provider of all that I Praise you to worship and thank you to yield to your word and 